All right. So I think we're good now. So let's talk about the analytical aspect of writing because that's a good thing to do. Um, the analytical aspect of writing has kind of some basic stuff to it. Um, so traditional um, vision, traditional presentations of the analytical, um, I'll discuss in just a moment. So as we do this, we're going to look at the kind of what the foundational model um, that if you've heard of analysis, you've heard of critical thinking, something like that ever before. Uh, some of this will sound familiar. If that's you, hooray. Um, shortly after we get through the basic level to provide a foundation, um, we are going, I'm going to be digging uh, deeper. So this might end up being a couple videos long to cover that foundational level. This is what you should know about analysis, no matter where you've been or where you come from, the, to, set a, to set kind of that um, base, that foundation. And then we'll push into specific types of analysis and some of the more complex things about analysis. All right, so with that, um, when we are thinking about the basic definition of analysis or something foundational, we analysis is essentially um, what, looking at something um, and trying to understand it better, um, pulling something apart to better understand the pieces, the quality, nature, attributes of those pieces, the relationships to each other and their role as part of a larger whole or composite or system. Um, so whatever that whole is, it could be a topic you're studying for a class. It could be something you noticed in your everyday life and you're just curious about. Um, whatever it is, when you're doing analysis, you're trying to push beyond just here are the basic common knowledge facts. I'm, but I'm trying to figure out how these pieces what they are first, identify them, what their qualities are, um, how they fit together, what their racial relationships are to each other and how they um, go into a larger whole to make something work or to make something functional or dysfunctional, depending on the situation. So we can use these critical thinking, uh, use this critical thinking lens in a variety of contexts, which is why critical thinking analysis is something that's often taught across the board. All right, so what I wanna do is um, give you a, um, a foundational understanding of uh, analysis that will, um, as it pertains to college level thinking of analysis and um, also uh, some specific types or techniques for doing that analysis um, and for thinking about how it affects your thinking. Okay, um, let's see. So, when we, uh, we, when we think about analysis, um, just to kind of make it practical for us for a minute, as we're thinking about how something might pull, be pulled apart, um, if you've ever worked on a Chilton's, worked from a Chilton's manual, it, um, trying to do something in your car, if you've ever put together Ikea furniture, or if you've just seen Tony Stark in the Avengers or one of the Iron Man movies, and he does that little uh, like hand spin thing and with one of his hologram inventions, and suddenly he's got all the parts um, separated in, separated and um you can see them and i think in one of the movies he like grabs one and like chunks it in a trash can and he's talking to jarvis or he's talking to friday or whatever it is um but essentially what we're looking at in that is a um fully blown out diagram um of all the individual parts and pieces that fit into that large composite um if you look to my right your yeah i think it's my right and you're right, um, then you'll see that uh, exploded version of a bicycle. And often when we think about bicycles and it's kind of the common knowledge thing, we'll talk about it as, oh, a bicycle has handlebars, um, uh, frame, wheels, uh, maybe spokes, maybe a seat, a chain, pedals. We might get, if we're trying really hard, we might get to 10 or 12 pieces. Um, and most of those pieces are things that if you pointed them out to an eight or a 10 year old, they wouldn't be all that surprised by it. All you'd be doing is reporting the facts of a bike. But when you look at this diagram to the right and we start looking at sprockets, wheels, gears, brake assemblies, um, the various pieces of the pedal, the nuts and bolts, and not just that, but how they fit together in an intricate and specific way. Um, a lot of those exploded engineering drawings, which is a specific genre of writing. Um, when you look at those exploded engineering drawings, you don't just see here are the pieces. You see the lines for how bolts and screws fit together. You see how it's placed into a much larger system. And so these are tangible ways that we see analysis kind of practically played out in our everyday lives. And so um, this is just, if it helps you get an idea of what we're trying to do with analysis, um, we're trying to take things, often things that aren't tangible and pull them apart and piece them or, and kind of figure out how the pieces fit um, 
like Nine Inch Nails says, I know the pieces fit. It's a whole other thing. Um, but we're trying to essentially do that with much more, um, much less tangible things, much more esoteric, ethereal, um, complex things than just uh, than a than something like a bicycle. Um, if you're in sociology, you're you're analyzing society and pulling apart its pieces. If you're looking at history, you may be applying critical lenses to figure out why things happened in the same lens. If you're in psychology or, or something like that, it's pulling apart people and how their minds work and how their behaviors link to that sort of practice. If you're um, if you're in a health class, you'll have like six dimensions of health and trying to pull apart, um, you know, physical, emotional, spiritual, familial, um, societal, and all those different realms of health or diet parts of health. So the idea is that if this helps you think through what analysis is, pulling something apart, understanding its pieces, how they fit together, and how what their roles or relationships are to each other as part of a larger composite, um, hopefully that helps. We'll come back to the car crash later. That's twice now. All right. Um, so as a quick overview of the components, um, I'm not going to talk about logic fallacies right away, um, because that's usually a more advanced thing. Um, you'll get stuff like that in philosophy classes or, um, sometimes even speech classes. Um, or if you've got a special introduction to college, like student success class, sometimes they'll deal with logic and logical fallacies. Um, but when we dig into that, we're going to dig into things like ethymemes and syllogisms, all kinds of fun things, um, and get beyond kind of fifth grade, yay, it's a bandwagon fallacy. But that's kind of how that works. Um, when someone says, um, because of A, because of B, therefore C, that kind of thing, um, they're dealing with that idea of logical thinking and kind of step-by-step -step sequenced out um, thought process. And so a lot of times when we, so that's one component, but we're not going to dig into it right away. Uh, other times when we're dealing with analysis, it'll just be kind of blanket termed either analysis or critical thinking or deeper thinking. Um, in writing, there are a couple, and, and in sociology and those sorts of things, there are a couple different models one might find um, that overlap with the, what we know as the sociocultural aspect of writing now, if you've looked at any of my other videos. And so that might be um, activity systems, writing ecologies, or just ecological models of society, actor network theory. Each of those kind of take a different slant on pulling apart um, much, much larger systems, specifically social systems. And so there are a lot of different models. Those are just three. But if you use them, if you understand them, um, you might get cool points in other classes. So we'll dig into that when we get there. Um, yeah, so those are some basic things. We'll discuss iceberg theory, which is, again, what part of that foundational model. The iceberg theory is where we'll make the shift between foundational, what you should already know, or what a lot of people will expect you to know, whether you ever learned it or heard about it or not anyways, and then um, versus what I want to give you, which is um, a little bit deeper, um, a little bit more hands-on practical, some very specific ways of doing this critical thinking, this thing we call analysis, and understanding how it affects brain, that kind of stuff. So let's keep pushing through. That's the brief overview. Um, I'm going to skip logical fallacies, but if you've got access to my slides, I do have um, some more on that. So let's go here. All right, when we talk about the iceberg theory, you've, some of you have heard of it. Think about it. What is it in your mind trying to find it? It's probably what you think. There's an iceberg. Um, so most of you, um, it's likely you've heard about this, um, if not in your writing class, in some class. In writing, um, it usually shows up, I want to say, in like junior, sophomore, even year. Maybe you even had like a seventh or eighth grade class that brought up iceberg theory. But the idea is that you can see stuff on the surface. Uh, and what's below the surface, you can't see, but you have to then infer um, information about. So you take the data you're given, you could either just report on what's the surface, or you can infer things beyond uh, the surface. So when we think about the iceberg theory, it's just that. Um, the idea is that there's a lot more mass, there's a lot more to look at and understand um, the deeper you go below the surface. Usually it's like a someone will give like a 20-80 ratio or 30%, 76% um, what's on the surface versus what's below. Um, so just to reiterate that point, if it's above the surface, we're dealing with what I can see, what I can observe, what I can report. Um, if it is below the surface, we're dealing with what I can't see. That may seem obvious, but here is the important thing. 
Um, if you're below the surface, that's when you're getting to analysis. You are inferring or interpreting the qualities of what I can't, of what you can't see based on what is visible or observable. So analysis is inferring or interpreting, interpreting the qualities of what you, I can't see based on what's visible or observable, what I can see. Um, so it was a tragic downfall. It's too soon. Is a century too soon? Moving on. Um, the challenge, and this is where we make the shift from a foundational version of um, analysis or the analytical aspect of writing to a, uh, d a more advanced version, is we need to ask the question, where's the waterline? Um, because the audience, our readers, when we write, complicate what counts as below the surface, what counts as what I should be able to see. Um, only because I like seeing that movie. All right. Um, so if the surface moves, um, or what might cause the surface to move? So this is kind of what happens and where a lot of writers struggle, especially when they're entering into a college environment or being expected to do academic writing. A lot of writers will struggle um, because they will have done analysis. They will have taken something that they understood and they will have inferred meaning deeper meaning and done critical thinking to better understand a system that they had not understand before, understood before or understood as well before. And that will count as analysis for that, um, that first year writer or that new student um, or that, um, that college student. The challenge is that may not read to their audience as new or interesting or deep. Um, so there's a little bit of, um, depending on who your reader is, depending on who your audience is, especially if they're more advanced than you in that thing that you're talking about, they may feel like you're talking about obvious things, common knowledge things, things that everybody knows about, especially if there's someone who's been studying that thing for 10 or 20 years, um, you know, and now they're teaching it. Like that can be a real challenge. Is um, in and as much as I don't think we should be framing projects based on an audience of one. Hopefully, you have instructors that are um, pushing beyond that idea of a uh, of write to me. Maybe they're finding ways to get you to write to to a community or write to um, specific stakeholders or specific audience members or even just your peers so that there's a little more variety in what kind of feedback you'll get. But if you are in a more standard situation where you're essentially writing essays to the teacher, uh, you might try considering where their level is at on that topic. Um, so one example I like to use, and I may have put it in another, in another video, is that when you're dealing with this uh, depth question, um, well, I guess first, if someone rolls up on, on an iceberg in a rowboat, there's a, they can't see below the surface. The water's dark. Whatever um, they can, they get to the they get to the top of the iceberg. They're like, dang, it's cold. There's lots of snow and ice and chunky stuff here, and I want a coat. Why am I out here in a rowboat? Because my ship just sank. All that sad. Still too soon. Um, what? But what? Hap but what may happen, and what they may not realize is happening, is on the other side of the iceberg, someone is over there in a heated wetsuit. I don't even know if that exists and snorkeling. And so they can see just below the surface, they can see five or 10 feet down. So the things that would count as analysis to the person in the rowboat who can just see to the surface, um, even, even the inferences they're making that they think are analysis, the person with a simple snorkel is already understanding. They're like, yeah, I can see five, 10 feet below the surface. Um, and then you and then you go to maybe another corner of another side of the iceberg and there's someone in a full-on submarine and this would be like someone who's expert in this topic and they are sinking 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 down 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 50 60 70 80 feet to the very bottom base of the iceberg uh, that kind of puts a lot of burden on the person at the top in the rowboat to try and compete with there's certain there's a, there's a certain point where you've got to find some other way to attack this problem so that it's more interesting because the person who just dropped down in the submarines like, yep, got that. Yep. Got that. Yep. Oh yeah. I understand that. That doesn't count as an hour. Like I can see that. So it's nice that you're, that you were able to predict it, but I can actually see it. Um, and all of that. So what counts as reporting or above the surface, um, and what counts as deep thinking analysis below the surface, 
uh, can shift based on someone's expertise, based on the types of tools they have for attacking a problem. So part of the reason I'm going to give you specific types of tools and talk you through some of that is because I want you to be able to adapt to an audience's level of expertise. And that's really partially a rhetorical consideration of scope. So when we get there, you want to draw connections. Um, I'll probably reiterate this, uh, but an example you might consider. So that's kind of the, the way you might imagine how analysis works, especially when, especially if you aren't feeling like you're in a position of expertise uh, and you're talking to someone who you feel like is more of an expert, you have to push a little further to give them something they'll find meaningful. Even if you found something meaningful at five feet below the surface, you want to try and push harder on that. So here's what you might consider. So if someone asks you to write an essay on the Civil War, and if I've used that, this example again uh, in the past video, forgive me, but if someone asks you to write an essay on the Civil War, what do you do? Um, you know, maybe you, maybe your initial brainstorm is, okay, Civil War, I'm going to talk about Abraham Lincoln, I'm going to talk about slavery, I'm going to talk about some sort of uh, gold, silver standard, or uh, financial challenges, and that sort of thing. Um, and those would be, those would all be things you could talk about connected to the Civil War. Uh, but those are also, many of those things are probably something that if you grew up in the United States, at least, uh, you might have heard about that from as early as fifth grade, sixth grade, seventh grade. Um, if you took a high school U.S. history class or an AP history class, uh, you are likely to have dug into some of those uh, fairly deeply. So when you get to college and you start approaching it with the same mentality you did in high school, um, you're dealing with people with uh, people on the other side of your paper who likely have got a master's degree in that topic because that's often what's required at the college level and, um, and who have studied this thing a lot uh, in many cases that, that was, that's, that's what their degree was all in. So with that in mind, um, some of the techniques that, or some of the techniques people often try to use, but don't work as well um, are they will try and approach the civil war, uh, you know, on a broad, broad, br shallow, broad level. And that you may gain something from writing a paper like that. But your reader, especially if they're expert, will find this will find it commonplace and won't find it as interesting. And then they they might feel like they're getting ten or fifteen or twenty of the same paper. Some of that's on them, but that's also kind of the academic culture that we deal with. So as writers, we want to anticipate that and give our readers something more meaningful, even if our readers are our teachers, um, because these people are often experts in their field. One can hope. Um, and so. A, way, a better way to approach it is to pick some very specific part of the Civil War and drill down deep into a specific part of it um, so that you get to something meaningful. The way, so by picking a specific thing, you know, maybe a specific person, a specific battle, a specific um, engagement or issue, uh, not just a broad issue, but uh, maybe uh, maybe slavery in a particular state or in a particular city or the experiences of one slave or um, the experiences of one freedman, um, something like that. Uh, and then using that to connect to those larger principles you're learning in that history class. That might be a way to give something unique and meaningful to your reader especially if they're expert. They may not be an expert in that specific thing, but they may like how you, do, they, the fact that you gave them something new to think about or new information, um, while also still showing that you used the lenses from the class, whatever they were, um, you know, the politics or the money or whatever, whatever situation it was, um, or the ethical um, foundation of the country at the time, whatever that is. So uh, with that, that is a key, a key principle that propels us past the foundational idea of analysis as pulling something apart to understand its pieces, the attributes and qualities of those pieces, the roles they have um, and how they connect to each other, their relationships and their relationship and role they have in the larger whole composite system that you're trying to analyze. Whatever that system or topic or thing is, it's very hard to pin down sometimes. So this is analysis, part one.